Good morning, and thank you very much for being here. My name is Anna, and I am an official of the European Commission, and I'm here for you today as moderator of this debate. The debate is being broadcast live on the web with simultaneous translation into English. The people here in the room, and also the public watching us on the web, will be able to put questions to our guests. For those of you who are watching remotely, you can use the Slido application through a code that will appear on the screen from time to time, and a QR code so that you can connect. Now, please put your phones in silent mode, and I will invite you to look at the image we have chosen to illustrate this debate which fits beautifully with the historical place we are in. It is a fresco painted by Lorenzetti in around 1330 in the Sala di Governo of the Town Hall of Siena. It illustrates good governance in the countryside. And here today, we will also talk about good governance. Today's debate is part of the Markets for People debate series, devised by the European Commission's communication expert, Ubaldo Stecconi, who is sitting here in the room. So what is Markets for People? Markets for People was born in Brussels in October 2022, with a conference attended by experts at the highest level and moderated by the then Vice President of the Commission and Commissioner for Competition, Margareta Vestager. It is very clear markets should be at the service of citizens and not citizens at the service of markets. That is the message of Markets for People, and that is the message we have been walking through several European cities since then. First it was Modena, then Salzburg. Today we are here in Salamanca. Next will be Brno. And what is the purpose? The aim is to spread the message of markets for people and to enrich it with the voices of the public and invited experts. And you may ask, what is the European Commission going to do with this hodgepodge of ideas? Well, it is going to take them into account when continuing to develop its competition policy so that it can make an effective contribution to building fairer markets, in other words, markets in which citizens, and not the shareholders of large companies, are the main beneficiaries. Without further ado, I call to the podium the rector and highest authority of this university, Ricardo Rivero. And on behalf of the European Commission, thank you very much for welcoming us. Good morning, good morning, thank you very much. Many thanks to the Commission, many thanks also to the National Commission for Markets and Competition, to the Europe Direct Center and to the speakers at this conference. Welcome to the Aula Salinas in the Edificio de Escuelas Mayores of the University of Salamanca. I think it's a good idea to hold this conference in this very place, because if you are going to deal with the subject of good governance, in the interior cloister of the historic building, you can find one of the best symbolic iconic representations of the message of good governance. Among the enigmas designed by the rector Perez de Oliva at the beginning of the 16th century, an enlightened academic who directed the destinies of this university and who combined his translation of Pico della Mirandola's dialogue on the dignity of man with treatises on the navigability of the river Guadalquivir and the capacity of the magnet stone to transmit sound. Among the enigmas designed by Perez de Oliva is one dedicated to good government that adorns the cover of the law faculty's legal journal. It features the scales of justice flanked by two animals, a dog on one side and an eel on the other, representing, respectively, warm blood, friendship and appreciation, and cold blood, aversion. And the message is, justice must be fair. Even if we like the dog more than the eel, fairness is about balancing all interests. And that is also the way those who weigh up and resolve conflicts and try to balance all the needs of each person must act. This enigma is completed in the idea of good governance with a much needed message in times when polarization threatens liberal democracies and the social market economy systems that explain Europe's prosperity. 
in which two elephants approach and two ants distance themselves from each other. And the message, which you can read inside in that book of humanism that is the Escuelas Mayores building of the University of Salamanca, is when there is harmony and we work together, as in the case of European integration, good things grow, but when there is discord, we become smaller and weaker. Let's not be ants. Let's not work against the process of European integration. Let's continue to aspire to unity and working together. Speaking of fair markets, the University of Salamanca and in this very building, as I was telling the media earlier when they asked me about this point, we must mention the week in which we announced the forthcoming commemoration of the fifth centenary of the arrival of Francisco de Vitoria and the creation of the chair of 1526. Vitoria must be cited, and always, of course, whoever wrote the books, because Vitoria was an excellent teacher, but we only have his notes, the ones taken by his students. Vitoria published fundamental texts in those volumes on justice and law about the organization of markets. Because in Domingo de Soto's time, there was a very high level of inflation in Europe that affected people's living conditions and their access to basic goods and services. Domingo de Soto had to make a statement on this point. He consulted the emperor, the merchants also consulted him, and from a defense of private property and market freedom, he upheld the need for regulations that would guarantee justice and prevent abuse. There are his treatises, the polemic on the regulation of poverty and begging, and also the treatise on usury and the limitations of insurance contracts and on financial services, and on the whole regulation of lending that was beginning to be when money became a source of creating profit opportunities at the time of the first globalization. An economic problem. If anyone wants to know how to build fairer markets, they should read Domingo de Soto. And Domingo de Soto, I concluded earlier, recalling an anecdote that Salamanca should never forget and which speaks volumes about the role of the university in Europe, Domingo de Soto and Francisco de Vitoria, in the first half of the 16th century, did not limit themselves to giving very good lectures to their students and writing excellent treatises on monetary theory, usury, poverty, and insurance contracts, subjects that are so contemporary. Domingo de Soto and Vitoria, when there was a great shortage and some speculators kept wheat in their warehouses, causing a famine in Salamanca, they moved and went to Toledo and brought wheat in wagons to feed the population. They preached and gave out wheat. This is what all European institutions and all national institutions have to do if they want to maintain the legitimacy of the integration process and democracy and the social market economy model. Preach and give out wheat, solving the needs of people who want more affordable and fairer prices for basic services. So thank you to all the rapporteurs. Thank you, Mr. Almunia, for being here and representing that pro-competitive political knowledge and action. And let's also bear in mind that people need wheat. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, señor rector. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. We have heard him. We have heard him preach and give wheat. The rector has to leave us now because of his busy schedule, but we are now going to hand over to Connie Fernandez, the president of the Spanish Competition Authority, who is about to close the annual meeting of the World Competition Authorities in Barcelona. Over to you, Connie. A very good morning to you all, and many thanks to the European Commission for inviting me and for organizing this debate in such an emblematic and unique place as Salamanca and its university. Congratulations on this initiative. I'm very grateful to the Rector for hosting this session and, of course, to all the speakers and attendees for participating. Looking at the program, I am sure it will be a great success. I would have loved to be with you all in person in the magnificent Alas Salinas, 
but I hope you will excuse me because the reason for my absence, the truth is that it is a weighty one today. As I was saying, Ana, and as I'm sure you all know, from Wednesday 18 and after having held on Tuesday 17 within the framework of the Spanish presidency of the Council of the European Union, the European Competition Day at our headquarters in Barcelona, we are hosting the 22nd Annual Conference of the International Competition Network, better known by its acronym the ICN is effectively the global network of competition authorities. We are more than 140 jurisdictions from 130 countries because there are also supranational organizations such as the European Commission and other organizations such as CDE or UNCTAD. In short, Everyone is represented here, including the World Bank. Among all the activities organized by the ICN throughout the year, the annual conference is the most important. In less than half an hour, I will close this conference where more than 400 people have been present, in addition to over 200 people following online. From all over the world, from all jurisdictions, authorities of all sizes, evolving authorities, some younger ones that we are trying to help by sharing our experience and our knowledge. During these last few days, we have discussed many issues, but many also related to the promotion of competition, very much related to the question we are asking today at this event, how can we make markets fairer? For example, we have debated how competition authorities have a special responsibility to observe the obstacles that markets present so that new talent, new companies, or promising young market entrants can access these markets with innovative ideas, and how to remove these barriers through recommendations to legislators, or how we can also bring this idea of competition to the areas most directly related to consumers, such as, for example, local authorities, which provide essential services. How to ensure that they do so in terms of competition in order to be more efficient in such important areas as health, education, transport, in short, services with which we are confronted every day and which can always be provided more efficiently and with greater competition. The promotion of competition plays a fundamental role in our work as competition authorities. It is crucial to transfer this culture of competition to all actors operating in the markets. It is also crucial to do so to the general public, and we must not forget our public administrations as well. Therefore, consolidating this culture of competition and good regulatory practices is one of the priorities of our objectives included in our strategic plan from 2021 to 2026, which covers the six years of my term as CNMC chair. In fact, competition policy is a necessary, essential instrument, I would even say, to promote a rapid, sustainable economic recovery, which helps us achieve these objectives of double transition, both ecological and digital but which is also inclusive, which also has a focus on the most vulnerable groups. We must not forget that effective competition in the markets is perhaps the first barrier to consumer protection, because it provides consumers with more affordable, new and innovative products, and furthermore, it is fundamental for the economic and social development of all countries. For businesses, for example, competition is a way to promote equal opportunities and to reward and stimulate entrepreneurship, merit, innovation and effort. Ensuring effective competition in markets improves productivity, facilitates innovation and promotes greater growth. And furthermore, we have no doubt that this is what can best provide benefits to consumers because open and competitive markets make it possible, as I said, to reduce prices as well as increasing the choice of goods and services available, and to improve the quality of these products and services. In the absence of a pro-competitive environment, there are insufficient incentives for companies to improve their products or innovate or become more efficient, preventing both new entrants and even their own business activities from succeeding. It is up to the CNMC 
to ensure that the conditions of competition in the markets are fair, removing the regulatory barriers that the private sector may encounter. We must maintain what we call the level playing field of competitors and identify those barriers. I'm not talking just about regulatory barriers, but also economic or other barriers that companies can create through collusion or, for example, via anti-competitive acquisitions of innovative companies, what we have come to call killer acquisitions, to ensure that competition is real and that innovative solutions prevail. And for this, we have not only the instruments for prosecuting anti-competitive conduct, but also these specific instruments for promoting competition, which I believe are going to be widely debated today. I'm going to give some examples of actions that we have recently carried out in the CNMC. There is a project that was financed by the European Commission that analyzes the impact of our actions in the promotion of competition. The period analyzed covers all the actions we have carried out from 2013 to 2019. Two external consultancy firms won this tender from the European Commission itself and concluded that more than 60% of our recommendations made concerning advocacy, in other words, in competition advocacy, have been followed by their addressees. We also challenge administrative acts and regulatory provisions before the courts with a lower rank than the law, when they impose barriers to access to economic activity, for example, or a project of which we are particularly proud, which we call Municipalities and Competition, which just this Wednesday received the ICN and World Bank Award in the Competition Advocacy Contest, in the category of Strengthening Institutions to Achieve Better Results in the Market, and which allows us to evaluate those initiatives that improve the quality of the interventions of the competition authorities. In this case, we have carried out this project in collaboration with regional competition authorities in Spain, but we have mainly involved municipalities, choosing success stories in which precisely a more competition-friendly intervention has created benefits for consumers, because it is essential to spread good news concerning competition, right down to the last town hall in Spain. In short, market intervention measures through regulation or public procurement, which is also one of our priorities, must be competitive, or the granting of public aid, which can also generate distortions in the markets, must be pro-competitive. To this end, it must be ensured that, in all cases, they comply with the principles of good regulation, proportionality, necessity, and non-discrimination. The role of competition policy and supervision is right there to keep markets open, competitive, to ensure that anyone who has an innovative idea can exploit it in the markets on its own merits. There are many challenges. In recent years, we have experienced unexpected situations that have, in turn, intensified changes that were already underway. For example, in terms of the energy transition, the environment, and above all, digitalization. Markets have also evolved at a dizzying pace, and the administration must accompany and exercise its powers to ensure that they function correctly, avoiding those distortions that can end up having a negative impact on consumers and businesses. And at the CNMC, as a key institution for economic development, we are fully aware of the importance of our work, and therefore our efforts are focused on correcting the failures observed in the market, ensuring that these markets function competitively and in a way that favors economic and social development. Events such as this one allow us, on the one hand, to effectively disseminate the importance of competition and, on the other hand, provide us with a very, very important opportunity to listen, debate and learn in order to improve. I reiterate my sincere thanks and congratulations, and I am sure it will be a very fruitful and enriching debate for everybody. We will be represented there by our Council Secretary, Miguel Bordeaux, who I am sure will convey our messages in the best possible way. Thank you very much to all of you, and may it be a success. Thank you very much, Carmen.
Great message from Connie Fernandez. Now I'm going to turn to someone who is in the audience and who is the president of the Academic Network of Competition Law in Spain, Professor Eugenio Almedo from the University of Malaga, and I would like to invite him to share with us his thoughts about Connie's words. Siempre es un placer eh, estar en Salamanca y además estoy especialmente feliz de poder hablar después de la presidenta de la, de la comisión porque creo que es una persona... It is always a pleasure to be in Salamanca and moreover I am particularly happy to be able to speak after the president of the commission because she is a very inspirational person and she has made it quite clear how important competition policy is and what great challenges we are facing today. As my presenter has rightly said, I am speaking here today as president of the Academic Network for the Defense of Competition and trying to highlight the role that the Academy or competition law scholars can play in order to promote more dynamic markets, more open to competitive operation, and that serve people, a functional market for citizens. And in this sense, we set up the Competition Defense Network nine years ago, combining the efforts that many other professors have been making independently, mainly in commercial law, but also in administrative law and private law and criminal law. We came together from all disciplines with the aim of also providing some doctrinal support, some support with our studies, our research into the ways in which competition law should evolve. As the president pointed out, we are at a very important moment in time to engage in the study of competition law because we are facing challenges that are certainly very stimulating. We face the challenges of the digital economy, the challenges of globalization, the challenges of the ecological transition, and all of that has a competition law aspect to it. In relation to what the president has said, I believe that we are at a very important time for analyzing situations such as mergers and monopolies. The legal framework we had for mergers and monopolies in Europe was based simply on economic factors, and we must also take account of the technological factor when authorizing or not authorizing them. The platform economy in which we operate generates important problems not only from the perspective of mergers, but also from the perspective of anti-competitive agreements or conditions of abuse of dominant position. And perhaps going back to the situation of the origins of the antitrust law in the 19th century in the United States with the neo-Brandeisians that is currently being talked about, we are probably returning to a situation similar to that of the origins of antitrust law. We are in an economic context in which there are five or six large companies at a global level, the GAFAMs, the large platforms, which have once again acquired a market situation that is no longer market power, but rather hyper-market power, or a hyper-position of dominance. The issue concerning the position currently held by Google, Amazon, and Facebook in the markets is not so much about competition, but more one of the regulation of the markets themselves. As the president of the CNMC has said, it's about building barriers to entry that perhaps can not be adequately addressed by means of the competition instruments that we traditionally had. And it is thus necessary to rethink and combine the efforts of competition law with those of economic regulation. We have done it in recent years with the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, as well as with the Data Act. The law, the regulation of artificial intelligence, and all these instruments have to be coordinated as well to regulate markets that work for citizens. There is, as you can see, much to be done. Thank you very much, Professor. And now we are going to hear what the experts have to say. So I'm going to give way to our guests. First of all, I'm going to call Ileana Izvernicianu, Director of Communications and Institutional Relations at the OCU to take her place at the table. Welcome, Ileana. Thank you, Ana. Shall I come to the end? At the end, please. I will now call on Fernando Carbajo, Dean of the Faculty of Law of this university. Go ahead, Fernando. 
Next is Joaquin Almunia, who has held and currently holds many positions, but he is here today simply in respect of his previous role as Vice President of the Commission and Commissioner for Competition between 2010 and 2014. Go ahead, Joaquin. Next, I'm going to call Adriana Casillas, a student of this university and entrepreneur, co-founder, and CEO of the Salamanca-based company Tebrio. And finally, Miguel Bourdieu, whom Connie Fernandez has already named, the representative of the highly respected Spanish Competition Authority. Would you like some water? Well, good morning to all of you, and thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. And now, without further ado, let's start with the questions. I'm going to start at the beginning and address the dean, Fernando. How and why did competition law come into being? Well, thank you very much, Anna. First of all, congratulations, and thank you very much to the Competition Commission for choosing Salamanca to hold this event. We are very grateful on behalf of the university, of the Faculty of Law in particular. As long as there has been trade, there has always been the idea of competition, although obviously it began to take shape many years later. There has also been the temptation to avoid competition, to broker agreements between traders or indeed to hoard products or services in order to achieve the greatest market power. In Rome, there were already some examples of the accumulation of grain that led to inflation, a rise in prices and forced measures to be taken. It also happened in the late Middle Ages and in the early Renaissance. It is appropriate to bring up the Constitution of Siena and the oligarchic government of the Nine Lords in the 14th century. I say appropriate because of the poster of this wonderful fresco of the Allegory of Good Government by Ambrogio Lorenzetti, which is in the Palazzo del Comune in Siena. There it was said that these oligarchic lords aimed to achieve perpetual peace which included economic prosperity, and the idea of free trade was very prominent. And there were also examples of price fixing to avoid the temptation for some traders to accumulate power, with grain being the perennial item at stake. I must mention the School of Salamanca, as the rector said in the 16th century, Father Francisco de Vitoria, Domingo de Soto, and Martín de Aspilcueta, who passed through these classrooms and developed the idea of fair prices and the free market. They did it from a theological perspective at the beginning, to avoid greed, to avoid avarice. But they objectified their assumption towards the development of economic principles that went, that then expanded and came. We always have the idea of the Anglo-Saxon market, but it is true that they developed here, and they spoke of the need to achieve a fair market a fair market with fair prices in favor of traders and res publica. In these classrooms, we can see that there are constant references to Dios Kivili, Dios Canonici, and the law of the Republic, this idea of the free market. The idea of competition was there, but it had not really developed. With the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, which converged in the 18th century, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, free trade, free initiative, freedom of enterprise were constitutionalized. And that is where the right to compete made a strong appearance already in the 19th century. But the right to competition arose in the United States with the Sherman Act in 1890 and the combat against the excessive market power of certain large companies, in particular Standard Oil. It was Senator Sherman's crusade against Rockefeller and the other dominant companies. And from then on, it was no longer just the right to compete but the duty to compete. And that is why the right to competition represents a limit to the freedom of enterprise. The right to compete involves two fundamental offenses, the prohibition of agreements between companies and the prohibition of monopolistic positions that later evolve into abuse of monopoly or dominant positions. This then spread to Europe after the Second World War, the reconstruction of Germany and Central Europe, and of course, in the European communities. And I repeat that in the process of European construction, Competition law is almost an implicit founding principle, logically, for competition law and then with the evolution. 
Mr. Almunia will explain this to us with much greater expertise about all regulations and all competition policies. But if we want a free market, a single market, free of geographical and political borders, it has to be a market protected by free competition and free competition as the right, but above all the duty to compete. That is to stop competing with others so that everyone can fight in the markets on their own merits. This is the concept of competition on merit or competition for efficiency. And we have come this far in a complex evolution where agreements between companies are fought, monopolies are fought, always with exceptions, because obviously the right to power evolves towards an examination of efficiencies and inefficiencies in the market. But we will talk about this a little bit later on. Certain conceptions of competition law have facilitated the accumulation of power, and in digital markets, we find ourselves once again in situations of excessive power. And perhaps we need to revisit the founding principles of antitrust law in the United States. What is the basic objective of competition law? To compete, to fight power, the accumulation of power, and the excesses that this accumulation of power entails. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. We are now going to move on from the origins. We are going to jump to the future, and I am going to address Joaquin. Joaquin, a follower of our social media, believes that in order to achieve fairer markets, we need to focus on the competitiveness of European companies so that they can compete with solvency with companies from other countries that are subject to less stringent regulations. What do you think about this, and is this the way forward? Well, I think that, first of all, we have to clarify the differences between the concept of competition, fair competition, free competition, and competitiveness. Of course, a company that seeks competitiveness by violating the rules of competition is not more competitive than others, it is more of a cheat. What competition requires, as the dean of the faculty has just said, is that the fair markets of which these lecture halls spoke in the 16th century should now be applied to the market economy of the 20th and 21st century. This means that anti-competitive agreements between companies are not acceptable and are legally prosecutable. Cartels that are assembled in a series of companies, as Adam Smith said already in the 18th century, in one room. As Adam Smith, the father of liberal market economics, said, as soon as a few businessmen get together and do not devote themselves to preserving the proper functioning of the market, they are conspiring against its proper functioning. Cartels, anti-competitive agreements between companies that are regulated in Europe on the basis of Articles 101 and 102 of the treaty, as well as in regulations that are applied by the European Commission and the competition authorities. Horizontal agreements between companies that distort competition, that create barriers to those who want to enter the market with new products, new services, more efficiency, better prices. Or vertical agreements between the manufacturer of a product and the distributors of the product that can reach an agreement, or the manufacturer imposes uncompetitive conditions on the distributors, and so on. Anti-competitive agreements therefore distort competition and do not allow for more competitive in a fair market. Then there are ways to achieve more market power, not through efficiency with respect to the rules, but through mergers of companies, mergers of companies, acquisitions of companies. The president of the Commission for Markets and Competition in Spain, Pani, was referring to what are called killer acquisitions. Very powerful companies that buy out their potential competitors before they start to harm them with their efficiency and innovation, with their prices, or with the quality of the services they provide. They buy them because they have economic power and absorb them into their structures, sometimes to enhance their market power even further or sometimes simply to eliminate these companies. 
They buy them and then they cease to exist. And then, in Europe, as we have a single market with the free movement of goods and services, there is a peculiarity in competition policy, which is state aid. Public aid must be controlled so that it does not distort competition in favor of certain companies and to the detriment of others through public support, economic support, subsidies or tax advantages received by these companies. This is what competition is all about. Competitiveness, based on compliance with the rules of competition, comes from efficiency, better prices, better margins that allow them to compete with better prices against other companies that want to absorb more income and do not fail to pass on prices to their customers and users. Merger control is not about mergers of companies. It is not an infringement of competition, but it has to be monitored. It has to be controlled before it comes into force so that competition in the market where the merger is taking place is not reduced. And public aid can often be justified by market failures, as economists say, because a public economic incentive is needed so that a certain economic activity can be developed in order to protect economic activities from those who create or try to create distortions from outside European borders. But competitiveness has to respect those rules of competition and be better than others, and that is fundamental within each national economy, favoring those that are more efficient and therefore more competitive, but also allowing them to overcome the barriers of European borders and also compete in third-party markets with other countries. And here it is very important that the rules of competition are respected so that there are more competitive, more efficient companies with a greater capacity to gain market share on their own merits and not because of traps or distortions in the rules of competition. Therefore, the distinction between competition policy and the competitiveness of companies must be made clear. Let's not seek competitiveness with markets that are not fair. We would then be going against the interests of citizens as consumers, as users. And also to the detriment of more efficient competitors who lose the battle because of the cheating of other companies. Now I am going to address Adriana. Adriana, your company is an example of innovation, of entrepreneurship. And first, could you please tell us what you do, because perhaps not everyone knows about your company's activity. And then tell me if, for you, the competitive pressure was an incentive or an obstacle when it came to developing your project. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. What does Tebrio do? Well, Tebrio is a technology-based company that uses life sciences to create a new industry and also to try to supply a very large market need that already exists and that is going to grow even more in the coming years. So what do we do? Through industrial processes that are typical of industrial technological development, we breed insects in industrial quantities and then transform them into raw materials or animal feed, such as proteins and oils and fats. And we also use all the other products that are generated in our facility for different purposes. On the one hand, to regenerate the land, also to increase crop production, both in extensive and intensive farming, through a biofertilizer, and on the other hand, also from the adult beetle, because this is an insect that has a form of life cycle from the adult beetle, we extract a polymer, which is ketin, which we convert into its salt, ketocin, and it has 
many biotechnological applications in cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, bioplastics, new materials, etc. We started in 2014. The idea originated in 2012, but we always had one thing very clear. And I think it was a total and absolute challenge because we were starting from scratch. This business model did not exist. So we had to develop absolutely everything around the business model itself. But one of the fundamental issues was that we had to be able to compete against the raw materials that were on the market. Because what is clear is that there is a need. Yes, and we are also providing very interesting raw materials on a sustainable level, not only environmentally, which is also true, but also over time, because they are stable products that you can always put on the market, but the market already tells you the prices at which it can consume it. They are the current prices of, for example, fish meal, if we are going to talk about the aquaculture feed, which is one of the areas in which we work. So that was a challenge for us because it made us organize the entire development of the project, investing a lot of money, not only in product development, but above all in the development of the process models such as machinery, machinery that was obviously being designed by us because the process is unique. So we were very clear about that. We could not put a product on the market, no matter how green it was, no matter how sustainable it was, if it did not compete directly with current prices. And I could even say, because it is one of the big problems in this animal feed market, I could even say that in the future they could be cheaper or more competitive than, for example, fish meal because we are not facing an unlimited business, fish meal, but less and less can be caught. There is less and less fish meal. So there is a need to find these alternatives. But at the same time, the aquaculture sector is growing out of all proportion and will probably be, in terms of animal feed, the one that feeds us humans. Aquaculture as a whole. So, of course, we were in a deadlock. In a clear blockage of how we are going to continue feeding the world, if we are always also related to competing with fish meal, what is the result really if fish meal was getting more and more expensive? We always had to bear this in mind, to try to have that positive impact on the population and the markets for people because that's why we were born. It's not a question for us. It was more than just developing a project. It was also about very positive impact for the society. Nothing more, nothing less looking for alternatives and offering new competitive and sustainable products. Great, thank you. I'm now going to turn to Miguel, secretary of the CNMC Council. Well, we have already seen that the Spanish Competition Authority plays a very important role and is highly respected in all international forums and carries out a lot of work in terms of promoting competition. You have recently published a study which I recommend everyone to read and which talks about competition and inflation. And I wonder, what has competition got to do with inflation? Well, thank you very much, Anna, and I reiterate the words of my president, thanking both the university and the commission. I believe that this type of event has much, much to do, both for the people attending and for those of us who are here as speakers, with the final idea of the event, which is to reach the citizen through competition. 
you always have the feeling, both as a competition authority and as a regulatory authority, that citizens often demand simple solutions to complex problems. And in this need to provide these solutions, I believe that, in this case, the CNMC, as an independent authority, has a series of obligations in terms of communication, in terms of being didactic in what it approves, but also in terms of always thinking that its actions in relation to the market, both in its regulatory and supervisory sphere and as a competition authority, must never lose focus of the fact that the citizen is the ultimate addressee. We are looking for good markets markets, but so that they favor the citizen. In this sense, I believe that the issue you are asking me about is very logical, and specifically the guide we have approved, which deals precisely with one of those key elements, in our opinion, from the perspective of promoting competition, which is how to link a phenomenon that affects us and I am not speaking in the third person singular, but that affects us daily in every visit to the supermarket, every time we fill up with petrol, every time we do any of our daily shopping. What does this have to do with competition? The general framework here is precisely this week, as the president said, we had the European Competition Day, the ICN in Barcelona. And I think it was an idea that both the European Commission and the General Director for Competition, as well as the Commissioner, the government itself at the European Competition Day, and I think the Secretary of State commented on it. All the competition authorities were saying that we should be careful in times of major crises or major situations of a humanitarian, warlike, or health-related nature, as unfortunately we are suffering and have been suffering in recent times, we must be careful here because this is where competition policies, precisely because they do not seem to be in the front line, take on special importance. And it is especially important that the competition authorities, I understand from their advocacy work, encourage this to always be in the spotlight. Because the result of all these crises is normally a very harsh effect on the market, and therefore on the markets, and therefore very harsh for citizens. So if the focus on the values and principles of competition is lost as a result of these situations, which are of course extraordinary, the future consequences, I must insist on this point, not only for the markets, but also for the citizen, who is the ultimate recipient of the markets, are very serious. And it is in this context that the idea of approving this guide to inflation competition arose, which attempts to link these two phenomena and seeks to demonstrate, based on the very good work carried out by the Department for the Promotion of Competition, the CNMC and the Council itself in its approval, but also by taking up the issue. I remembered when Professor Eugenio Olmedo spoke of this collaboration, this need to interact with the Academy also taking up the main doctrinal positions on the issue, how this phenomenon of inflation can be tackled from a competition perspective, which is certainly not the first tool that comes to mind when talking about inflation, which is probably more linked to monetary policies, to other different issues. But to highlight this, because what it shows is that it is necessary, especially to protect those most affected by inflation, who are always the people in the greatest difficulties in society, that there are competitive markets, that there are efficient markets that allow these major crises to be tackled with greater stability and within the possibilities to reduce price rises. And that is why this guide has two main objectives. Firstly, to continue with promoting the culture of competition to make citizens, companies, and all those who are interested in competition aware that competition also improves the situation of citizens, improves their possibilities, and will ultimately affect their purchasing power. And secondly, to demonstrate specifically with concrete tools, both for companies and for public public administrations, how competition can be used to mitigate the effects of inflation. And here you can see within the guide that there is extensive content that I also recommend reading because I think it is very well thought out so that it can be read and so that the citizen can understand it on a general level.
mejora la oferta, mejora la eficiencia en la producción y sobre todo But if it is considered o, o firstly as good competition, competition it improves supply, improves efficiency in production and above all no eliminates or mitigates as far as possible the incentives that companies may have in certain contexts eh, not to modify them or to maintain prices and to affect inflation. Eh, it has an impact on how a competitive economy with flexible markets, with efficient markets, can better withstand sudden changes in the economy and therefore prevent the citizen from receiving the full weight or the full cost of these changes that are alien to him or her. Se hace alusión también a una, a una cuestión que a nosotros como autoridad integrada también nos preocupa mucho y nos, nos, nos interesa mucho que es... There is also a reference to an issue that we, as an integrated authority, are also very concerned and interested in, which is how the regulation of certain... Within this idea of promoting good, efficient markets, efficient markets and this whole idea of competition in all markets, how in certain markets, such as the energy market, the transport market, which are also subject to regulation and supervision by the CNMC, how the effect of good markets in these strategic areas multiplies the positive effects on all prices in the whole market. Because avoiding inflation in energy prices, in transport prices, is going to have repercussions for the entire economic system. Therefore, it is also another idea that worries us a lot, and in general, as I said at the beginning, it can reach the citizen. It can reach the citizen and reduce these price rises and this inflation that is so detrimental to them. And all of this is supported, as I say, by doctrinal studies, which also analyze the other side, that is to say, how in situations where this does not occur, namely in infringement contexts, we find markets in which the principles of competition have little weight, how the effects of inflation are much worse for the citizen and in general affect the market in a much more unfavorable way. Thank you very much. Now we are going to talk about consumers. That's why I have Ileana here. Your organization also has a contribution to make to this cause. Please tell us what a consumer association can do to promote fair competition and ensure freedom of choice for the consumer. Thank you very much, Anna. And first of all, of course, I would like to thank the European Commission, the Directorate General for Competition, and the University of Salamanca, which is so kindly hosting us to organize this event. Two words beforehand to explain what OKU is, in case there are people who may not know us. OKU is the most representative consumer organization in Spain today. We are members of the Council of Consumers and Users, which is a body under the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, and we work closely with other European organizations, not only in competition, but also in other areas. Because, as you know, many consumer issues are already part of the Aquis Communautaire. They are given to us by the Commission and by the European Parliament, and therefore we work within BEUC. We are part of the executive. BEUC is the umbrella organization of 43 European consumer organizations the most important ones, and we work from there to have reliable information and competitive markets here in Spain. And to answer your question, we are going to celebrate 50 years of activity in just over a year's time. OKU was founded in November 1975, and we really believe that a competitive market, in line with what Miguel was talking about just now, is when consumers can choose freely when they have a wide range of product services and can choose freely. And how can they choose freely? When they have accurate information about what they can find in the market. That difference between effective competition with that freedom of choice is what differentiates real competition from simply a free market economy. And we believe and work very much in line with the CNMC to help the consumer make choices. What does the OKU do specifically, and what do we think consumer organizations should do to contribute? Well, first of all, what we do is to give that reliable and truthful information about products and services that you can find in the market so that that you can act freely. Because, as we all know, we are all consumers. As Kennedy said many years ago, and we make acts of consumption from the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed. And with this real information, and with this act of consumption, we can reward or punish a company, a service provider.
if it does well or badly. And therefore, with this lesson, we can improve competition. It can make those companies that are not very competitive, that, as Miguel said, also increase prices in an irregular way, it can punish them by not buying that product, that service. We provide this information through magazines, which is the standard form, which we did not invent ourselves. They are comparatives we copied from Consumer Report, the American organization, and now what we do is work on comparators because we are going digital. The consumer is becoming more and more digital, although there is a gap that we don't want to forget about, namely the analog consumer, and we provide information in which there is no advertising. There is no payment from any company to position itself, and we offer consumers what is on the market so that they can then choose freely. Apart from this information, we do good lobbying work because lobbying has certain connotations, as you know, sometimes a little negative. It is pressure so that the configuration of markets that have also been mentioned, such as electricity or transport, in which there is sometimes opacity, can be better configured. That is why we work closely with the CNMC to put pressure on those sectors that we believe need to improve distribution, energy, although it is improving, transport, and when that second step fails or is not sufficient, we move on to complaints, active complaints that we pass on to the CNMC and that I will go into in more detail later if we have time. But, for example, we have been involved in cases such as against the dominant position that was mentioned some time ago. An interesting case was Carbonell olive oil, in which there was a unilateral fixing of the price that obliged a distributor to give a certain price. Other very interesting cases involve situations when there is no other means of action and when information has failed. Representation and pressure have not been effective either, and so we turn to complaints. We have already had successes as a consumer's organization in improving the market position of consumers who play a very important role because they represent the demand. We must clean up the market and try to help there to be better competition. That's great. Thank you, Ileana. Well, that's it for the first round of questions. We now have a few minutes for questions. If anyone would like to address our experts, now is the time. Also, those of you who are following us on the Internet can now ask questions via the Slido application. There you have the Slido code on your screen. But if you don't get burned by the questions inside, we're going to continue because there's still a lot to talk about. And we're going to move on to the second round of questions. Just a moment, please. I'm told that I have to see if we have any questions remotely. Here I have a question which is going to be, well, I'll put it openly to all the experts and whoever feels most comfortable with it will take the floor. The question is this. How can consumers defend themselves if they are victims of a competition infringement? Miguel, maybe? Miguel? Well, the simplest answer is to bring it to the attention of the competition authority. I believe that another of the areas in which we are trying to improve our approach to the citizen is the possibilities of precisely how the different formulas for bringing the existence of some type of infringement to the attention of the competition authority. There is the complaint in its most classic sense. It is the typical tool of leniency in the field of competition. The whistleblowing directive has recently been transposed into Spanish law and completely anonymous channels of complaint are being encouraged in the case of certain infringements detected in the field of work and business and whose consequences, any negative consequences, are to be dealt with. And I believe that, in general, the idea is to promote the idea that citizens, in almost any way, can bring to our attention what they obviously consider to be an infringement, without prejudice to whether or not this leads to the initiation of a procedure, 
with all the guarantees and with the Commission's investigative tools. Thank you. I think Ileana can complete the answer. Yes, I wanted to take advantage of this excellent question to go a little further. Although there are experts here, especially the CNMC, the channel that Miguel said is correct through consumer organizations as well, but then there is a but. When there is a decision by the CNMC, by the Anti-Competition Authority, consumer redress is very complicated. In order to do that, you have to take civil or commercial legal proceedings, as can happen right now in the dealer cartel in which there is a sanction ratified by the Supreme Court, in which there was a cartel, there was a price pact involving all manufacturers and dealers, a lot of Spanish dealers, which created harm for the consumer, real harm, because they had bought more expensive cars than they could have done from 2006 to 2013, the cartelized period. And there is a decision by the CNN. MC, I insist, ratified by the Supreme Court, well, in order for the consumer to be compensated and to recover the money, they have to initiate legal proceedings. As we all know, it is costly, long, and tedious. We are faced with very powerful lawyers in front of us. The automotive sector in Spain is a powerful sector, and therefore, we would have to think about, here I launch, some way in which there would be immediate compensation, because what is happening right now is that the consumer either joins a collection collective action, or has an easier option because he has a family member, a lawyer, or he gives up and is left without compensation. So I wanted to provide you all with this food for thought. Fernando. Yes, in relation to this, one of the most topical issues in competition law concerns actions for harm arising from anti-competitive offenses. We have the example of the Lorry cartel. Now we have the dealer's cartel. When we talk about compensation for years, we go to tort law, to civil law. And here the tort has to be determined and quantified. We are seeing this in the very many court rulings that have reached the Supreme Court in relation to the Lorry cartel. In other words, in the end, the compensation is minimal. We are talking about very small amounts, and this when we talk about lorries and cars. If we moved on to much smaller products, the defense of consumers regarding harm arising from anti-competitive offenses necessarily involves an adequate structuring of collective actions, which is a very important regulatory deficit in Spain. The European Union is now working on a new regulation that brings us closer to or facilitates the exercise of collective actions, above all through consumer organizations. In common law, there is the figure of punitive damages, which is what I was suggesting, that there should be an immediate compensation once it is accredited or there is sufficient evidence to presuppose the existence of harm. Then the damage is objective. Our legal tradition is based on the compensation of compensation actions. And that leads us to this need to demonstrate the damage and quantify it. It is a debate that was already in the Directive on Harm in 2014, and a debate that had been going on for a long time, from the Green Book, the White Book. But in the end, an attempt was made to move towards a more punitive model. But the tradition was respected, and the truth is that it is not effective. It does not work. It does not work efficiently to protect consumers in this field. Yes, Joaquin. A comment on that. When I was in the Commission in Competition, when we were discussing with the European Parliament and with the Council, but especially with the European Parliament, how to organize the regulation at European level of compensation for harm through not only individual claims, but through class action claims, there was very strong opposition in the European Parliament and in some governments because they thought that this would lead to importing to Europe the abuses committed with class actions in the United States. Where very powerful law firms abused their power to obtain compensation for harm, which in some cases was greater than the harm actually quantified, because it was a fantastic income for the powerful law firms. And so there was a fear of transferring to Europe this collective action that had produced so many cases of abuse in the United States. So what we did in the Commission at the same time as the 2014 Directive on Compensation for Harm was finally approved, 
was to make a recommendation to the governments of the member states and to the parliaments. The European recommendation is not binding. It is merely advice, a request, but not binding on the member states to try to regulate at national level the collective actions that exist in the consumer protection law, but not in the compensation for harm for competition infringements. What I do not know is what has happened in the last few years, whether there have been European countries that have regulated class actions to compensate damage for antitrust infringements. I really don't know. I know that in the case of trucks, compensation for damage has been obtained, but of course, in this case, the direct victims of the increase in truck prices due to a very powerful cartel that lasted for many years were the large companies that were willing to alleviate the reputational damages and the legal consequences by trying to compensate the large dealers who bought the trucks. Of course, there have been other cases, such as that of car dealerships, which is more widespread. The collective has been directly affected in their accounts, in their pockets, and I don't know how it happened, but I think it is essential to accompany the sanctioning of a cartel infringement or abuse of position with a fine paid by the companies and paid into the European Union budget, which is then distributed to the governments of the countries. De una infracción, de un cártel o de un abuso de posición, que es una multa que pagan las empresas. But we must also compensate the victims, consumers and users of these abuses, of these infringements. And I believe that this step has yet to be completed in the European legal system. De esos abusos y de esas infracciones, y ese paso, yo creo que está por completar. Thank you very much for raising this issue, something that is still pending in order to make markets fairer, to speed up citizens' access to compensation for harm. Thank you. Well, oh, we have a question. Well, good morning. Congratulations to all the rapporteurs. With regard to the issue of collective actions and this European directive on representative actions, in response to Joaquin Almunia's question, Portugal has transposed this directive and now has a very active system of collective actions. In fact, some consumer associations, for example, Us Omnibus, are already bringing more than 25 collective actions, are in the making because they are very long processes, but Google is being sued. TikTok is being sued. Estee Lauder is being sued. Actions are planned against the banking cartel. That is to say that the major banks and also the car dealerships are going to be taken to court. I want to ask Ileana a question in relation to these collective actions, because I read the day before yesterday that OKU is going to bring collective actions precisely against the car manufacturers in relation to the cartel. It was presented yesterday. So my question, given that Spain is more than a year late in transposing this directive on representative actions, I imagine that the route used has been Article 11 of the Civil Procedure Act, the old regime of actions, which has proved to be quite ineffective so far, I wanted to ask you for your assessment of this preliminary draft of representative actions and their possible direct effects of the directive after a year of transposition and also of other mechanisms that are now being used to ensure that consumer rights are not merely a dead letter, as they are in the field of competition in many cases, which is the transfer of the right to complain. Now there are companies like cartel damage claims or other companies that, given that a consumer does not go or even a businessman or a company will not claim these damages given the difficulties of the process, the company acquires the right to claim. And well, I think that they have been quite effective, for example, with flight delays, even if it is out of competition. So please consider this option, because although some judges defend them, other judges have been quite reluctant to accept this transfer of rights. Yes, thank you very much for your question. In fact, what we use is the Civil Procedure Act. As a representative association, we have the legal standing to take this type of action. We have been doing it for a long time. We would like the directive that has already entered into default in Spain to be transposed, which I believe is going to be transposed shortly, because if there is any modification, any improvement, such as the one you are mentioning, the entry of litigation funds, as is already happening in the United Kingdom, has a lot of history. And we believe in principle that if there is transparency, there is nothing against it. OKU's point of view is that we are not representing all consumer organizations here because we believe that 
that as these lawsuits are so costly and the class actions we have filed for diffuse interests are so long, that is, we represent the entire class of four million people affected in Spain by this cartelized period, we can easily be talking about six, in all instances, six, seven years to obtain a final judgment, which means that there are many consumers who do not even think about it. If these companies acquire the litigation rights and, in the end, basically work to succeed, they are, as I understand it, a part of it. In other words, they don't have to make any provision of funds. When they get the compensation, they are deducted for all this service. So, in this case, we believe that it can speed things up. The directive provides for this. The other European organizations we work with through Bayuk are also pro. They don't see anything against this. As long as, I insist, there is transparency, clear causes, all the conditions in large print. If there is no small print, there would be nothing against it. Because we believe that this could, at least initially, encourage consumers to take the plunge, to lose their fear of suing these types of companies that make collusive agreements. Excuse me, I'm going to ask you to tell me your name, please, and then if Fernando would like to add something to the answer. Very well. Thank you. And a member of the academic network. That's great. Fernando, in the Republic of Ireland, there is already a consolidated system of class actions for the protection of collective and diffuse interests, and an action has been brought against Facebook under the adhesion system, which is very typical of the Anglo-Saxon system. In other words, someone brings an action, perhaps a law firm, as Mr. Almunia said earlier, and consumers can join in. But the average amount of compensation is 60 euros per user. You have to be very keen to join the initiative. Another thing is that we may be talking about vehicles, but in an individual action against a dealer, it is possible that the expert's report will be more expensive than the compensation that is finally received. If there are no condemnation costs, well, obviously not, there is the consumer initiative has to go through a class action, otherwise it is very complicated. It is indeed. So we have a lot to do. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Let's move on now to start. Ah, sorry, another question. Please say your name before asking the question. If you would stand up, please. My name is Ricardo Fernandez, and I would like to ask you, well, I suppose everyone has noticed that in the last two years, we have had very high inflation rates, and recently a report by the International Monetary Fund has revealed that part of the cause of this inflation is the large profit margins of the large electricity companies. And speaking now of consumer redress for abuses by the cartels in the transport industry that happened several years ago, I would like to ask what action can the citizen, the government, the union take to claim redress for something that we are all suffering from, which is this huge rise in the cost of living. How can we take action against these big electricity companies that are not, in the end, making the markets for the people, but they are, as you said at the beginning, making the people for those markets, and they are, in the end, complicating our whole standard of living and, in my opinion, doing a great abuse to the customer. And ultimately, it's not just affecting the electricity sector, it's affecting all of our lives. Can we change this situation in a way, either bottom-up or up-down, all of that? Who is going to take the plunge? Come on, Joaquin. I'm not an expert on how the systems of electricity companies and electricity oligopolies work in many countries, but I think I can give a quick answer. It is true that the Monetary Fund and many other economists and institutions that analyze the economic situation have said so. It is true that in this inflationary period there has been, on the one hand, an increase in costs, in inputs, energy, natural gas, oil, food, and so on. 
In origin, there has been a supply shock that has raised the cost of many companies and sectors. One of these has to do with the prices of energy, electricity and gas that reaches us consumers. And this has two answers, in theory. Then it has to be adjusted to each system, to each country or to each type of organization of the electricity market, of the energy market. One, taxes. And in fact, there are experiences, including Spain, but not only in Spain, of taxing extraordinary profits, which are called windfall profits. Look, you have been lucky because you have raised input prices and you have the market power to pass on the increase directly to your customers who need to receive the electricity you generate or the gas you supply. And another possibility, apart from raising taxes, is to analyze the situation of this market from the point of view of the functioning of the market in accordance with the rules of competition. There are oligopolies, there are abuses of dominant position, and this has a response from competition policy, and in the case of regulated sectors, such as the energy sectors, from regulation also. A proposal to reform the wholesale electricity market in the European Union was approved in the Energy Council just a few days ago which was leading to much higher prices in the spot market, in the day-to-day -day market, than were reasonable in terms of costs and the situation of that particular market. The European Parliament now needs to reach an agreement with the Council. The Commission is acting as an honest broker to get that agreement reached. I hope it will be reached before the end of the year. And then the functioning of the electricity market, as it has been approved, should result in lower wholesale prices and therefore will be passed on to lower retail prices and to users. Those are the techniques in general, without going into the details of each country, which could go into the Spanish one. But we are talking about more general electricity markets. Yes, apart, thank you, Anna, apart from what Joaquin has already said, which I totally agree with, here in Spain they have acted very well because they have put the tax on the profits. What was it? Windfalls from the sky? Profits, sorry, fallen from the sky. Which is true because we think it has also been criticized a lot, but that has been good. But there is another part that the user can do. I link it to the first answer, information. Consumers normally receive many calls from companies offering the best fixed-term contract. You have to inform yourself. There is a tool from the CNMC. We have another open tool on our website which tells you with your energy bill which company best suits your needs with real prices. If we as consumers do our homework, if we do this exercise, which will take us 10 minutes, we will really know that the company that is calling us is giving us the wrong information and what they want is to keep us as a customer for two years, right? So it is our job to receive the information and use it. And then the CNMC also, and I am finishing, has a lot to say. For example, we denounced a company called Audax Renovables, which was engaging in unfair competition because it was using bad practices, making calls, offering, saying that they were offering the best contract, impersonating, saying that it was your own company, that it wanted to improve you. We reported it to the CNMC, and it imposed a fine for unfair practices. So here, the role of the CNMC is very clear the role of an informed consumer, and then, of course, the Spanish government, which, if I may say so, has done very well in this case. And what Joaquin was saying about this pact that has been obtained in Europe very recently has followed very much the guidelines that Spain already did, that the Ministry of Ecological Transition proposed, which is why we have been pioneers here. Thank you. Thank you. Information also to reach fairer markets. A lot of information. We have several questions here in Slido, but I think we are going to continue with the debate because there is still a lot to discuss and we will come back to them at the end. So now let's go on. We still have to deal with a very topical issue, which is the issue of digital platforms. And now I have a question for Joaquin Almunia and also for the Dean. 
Today, the presence of large digital platforms is obviously overwhelming and almost monopolistic. So what can competition policy do to protect not only users, but also innovative companies trying to carve out a niche for themselves among such giants? What should be the objectives pursued by competition policy? Joaquin. Well, quickly, because it is a very broad issue that is causing a revolution in competition policy in Europe, but also in many other countries, the United States and many others. The big digital platforms in the digital markets in which they operate are becoming quasi-natural monopolies. And when the existence of natural monopolies was analyzed decades ago, back in the 20th century, the solution in many countries was to create state monopolies. They say if markets generate quasi-monopoly situations because they function in a way that the result of the market game is to generate monopolies or quasi-monopolies, then the monopoly should be public, and then the corresponding state through its government or the government of the country should create a state monopoly. Its parliament manages this in the general interest. But in the case of the digital economy, it would be an illusion that would lead us to disaster to think that it is the states that should manage digital platforms because they point towards monopolistic or quasi-monopolistic situations. The only thing missing would be for states to have all our data and do whatever they want with it. It would be Leviathan in its purest form. I don't know if it was analyzed here in the 16th century, but Hobbes, who was a century or two later, analyzed it several centuries ago, and that would be tremendous. It's a bit like China, of course, but we don't want to be China from a political point of view. So what should we do? Competition policy, pursuing abuses of dominance, pursuing mergers that try to eliminate potential competitors, etc., etc., is acting. And there are rulings, and there are fines, and there are decisions backed by the European Court of Justice against Google and against other big digital platforms. But experience has shown that the investigations to present legally sound facts, evidence that cannot be refuted by the big platforms that have hundreds of lawyers working for them, take a long time. And as the evolution of these digital markets is increasingly accelerating, by the time the judgment comes, the original problem has already changed in nature, and there are other abuses of position and other risks for competition. And then it's a race, like the fable of the hare and the tortoise. Then regulation is chosen, and Europe is the first jurisdiction. The European Union has regulated the Digital Services Act. Earlier, the representative of the Academic Network of Competition Authorities, or competition experts here in Spain, referred to the law on digital markets, the law on digital services, the law on data. In its day, the law on the protection of the privacy of citizens with regard to data held by platforms, and so on. Regulation is beginning to play a very important role to avoid taking decisions that would be taken by competition policy. But in a timely manner, so that the damage caused by abuses is not prolonged over time, and decisions are taken in time to be corrected. Why does this tendency towards a natural monopoly occur? I'll put it briefly. Because we lend them our data. Doing a search on Google portrays us to Google. Buying books or any other product on Amazon portrays us to Amazon. And operating on a social network, whatever it is, portrays us to the owner of that social network. And with this immense accumulation of data, they are generating new business thanks to the fact that they own the platform that allows them to accumulate so much data. So apart from having power over us, we give them the data for free. 
in exchange for receiving a free service, but the data we give them is much more valuable than the services they provide us with in many cases. But in addition to that, they are eliminating competitors in all those businesses that open thanks to the processing of the data that we are providing them. So it is not only a risk for us of the amount of data in the hands of those platforms for what they want to do, but it is a risk that is removing competitors from the services that the platforms generate because of their market power and their immense accumulation of data. And that requires regulation, and it requires action as soon as possible. And this is even more the case in the age of artificial intelligence, which is developing at a tremendous speed and going after Microsoft for ChatGPT or whatever you call the generative artificial intelligence that Microsoft or Google has, requires regulation. Pursuing it ex post is going to lead us to the conclusion that we are not reaching the necessary speed to prevent the risks that exist. Some believe that they are more, and others believe that they are less of artificial intelligence. Therefore, we are at a time of regulation, and the ability to apply the regulation, as the rector said earlier, to apply what has been judged. The fundamental thing about regulations on large platforms or digital markets is that the authorities in charge of applying them are effective which in turn requires learning a great many things that neither the competition authorities nor the regulatory authorities of the countries knew just a few years ago. We are facing an enormous challenge in which competition policy and the regulations linked to competition policy play a role and must play an impressive role in the coming years. Even more important is the role they are playing in the analog economy. Fernando. Yes, to complete what Joaquin has explained very, very well, when the Sherman Act was passed in the United States, a debate arose as to what the objective was, whether it was to protect small competitors from larger competitors, predatory conduct, and so on, or to protect consumers. Over the decades, the second option has been imposed, and a fundamental hermeneutical parameter of the right to competition has emerged which is consumer welfare, especially in terms of prices, especially in terms of prices. In other words, if there is no price increase, a restrictive interpretation of the right to competition must be made. If there is no price increase, then the conduct must be tolerated. This caused and continues to cause an impressive accumulation of power, facilitating economic concentration, facilitating agreements between companies that are hardcore cartels and in the position of dominance in the United States, for example. There are very few cases of abuse of dominance. There is now a very important one against Google, and I don't think there has been a more relevant case since Microsoft in the late 1990s. When we transfer this to digital markets, we find that many of the services are free because, as Joaquin rightly said, we pay with our data. Multi-sided markets. The consumer says, it's free. No, you are paying for it with your data, with your search preferences, and with your personal data, directly in services where you are asked for some kind of registration. Of course, in that context, because the accumulation of power turns us into quasi-monopolies, what they call gatekeepers, guardians of access to markets, we must always think in the short term and in the medium term. When it is free, in the short term, it will lead to a greater accumulation of power that will cause these companies to expand into other downstream or related markets where they will increase prices, so that in the medium term, the consumer's interests will be violated, but in the medium term, they will also end up with many competitors. In other words, the market is closed, or the small competitors are kicked out of the market, or they are bought out, as Professor Olmedo said earlier. So the parameter of consumer welfare must be replaced by consumer welfare must be interpreted correctly, and we must think in terms of general aggregate welfare, in which, of course, the interests of consumers and users are a fundamental and essential part. 
But in order to satisfy the interests of consumers and users, there must be effective competition, real competition. And this means that as many companies as possible must compete, and not only in terms of price, but also with regard to the best conditions of supply and pre-sale and post-sale, advertising, and so on. At this point, as Professor Olmedo has also commented, come the Neo-Brandeisians, inspired by Louis Brandeis, a U.S. Supreme Court judge, who said that the fundamental objective of competition law is to fight against market power and thus satisfy the general interest, not just to think about prices, about a technical analysis of prices. Nowadays, there is a lot of talk. There is a trend known as the hipster antitrust, which is a bit like that. The neo-Brandeisians say, let's not only look at prices, let's try to ensure that the right to competition achieves the objective of having the greatest number of operators because that puts pressure on prices and also the supply is much greater and also the right to competition is extended to other possible ends. Innovation, Schumpeter and the Neo-Schumpeterians tell us that the right to competition, in addition to allocative efficiencies, that is to say reducing prices, is also a driver of innovation. If we add intellectual property to this, the idea of dynamic competition, dynamic efficiencies, appears. There is also talk of privacy or personal data or the labor market. In these first two decades of the 21st century, we are still living in a context of people for markets. The data economy, that is to say, the oil is data. The new oil is data. And it makes these giant groups and all their companies, the whole constellation of their group of companies, work around data. We have very significant cases, such as Google's self-preference in the autumn or September-October last year, where using personal data in Google's price comparison and in Google Shopping, Google companies or companies linked to Google are ranked higher than the rest of the companies. Abuse of dominant position. And very significant is the ruling of the Court of Justice on 4 July this year against Facebook, a case that comes from the German government where it goes further and talks about the fact that the competition authority has to collaborate with the data protection authority and data protection agencies, and that there can obviously be an abuse of dominance in the massive use of big data, the accumulation of data. And there may also be breaches of European regulations and national personal data regulations. And so we arrive at a paradigm shift, which is the digital markets regulation of September last year, where action was taken a priori. Competition law acts a posteriori. It analyzes market conduct, agreements between companies, abuse of dominant position, in Spain, more reinforcement for unfair acts, and assesses whether or not competition is affected. Now we are acting a priori. We are not talking about a dominant position. We are talking about basic platform services, and we are talking about gatekeepers. Thus, large operators that meet a series of qualitative and quantitative conditions will be qualified by the Commission as gatekeepers. A decision of 6 September this year designated six gatekeepers for eight basic platform services. The GAFAMs, the infamous GAFAMs. And from here, what the regulation on digital markets, fair and equitable markets, which is what it is called, which is very significant, does for this change of people for the markets or markets for the people, establishes a series of obligations that are prohibitions. You can't do this, for example, in relation to the, and I end to the Facebook case. You can't combine personal data that comes from different basic platform services that are accumulated in the same company, which is the case of Facebook, which bought Instagram and bought WhatsApp. So when we say in a WhatsApp group that we want to go for a walk in Turkey, we already have personalized advertising. Moreover, excluding others, other operators, and we are in that change, in the regulation of contestable and fair markets that says this is prohibited, except for a series of exceptions. And it also leaves the door open for the European Commission to extend these, these conducts that would be prohibited, these obligations, an a priori action that is clearly a regulation, but which does not exclude the continued application of traditional competition law in cases where the conditions for this do not apply. And then we have the right to damages.
Tort law has an important deterrent effect, damages for anti-competitive offenses, because penalties can be foreseeable and can even be counted. We are talking about penalties. Google has been fined 4.1 billion euros for one case and 2,400 euros for another. But I was saying before, 8,000 maybe. Well, maybe if we pick our own pockets, it's something similar for them, although the penalties increase a lot. But the actions of the year are unpredictable. So the deterrent effect is important. The problem is that we do not have adequate procedural weapons to make them effective enough to make that deterrent effect a reality. That's great. So more information, speeding up claims for damages, and further deepening digital regulation. Three items on the list. And before we run out of time, I wanted to hear from the representative of innovative companies here. I wanted to know, Adriana, you have been working for 10 years now. What is your opinion? How is the regulatory and competition framework evolving to respond to the needs of companies like yours? And what remains to be done? Well, in this case, I think the situation is a bit different from what I said before, with the digital markets, because we can say that they are very new markets. In our case, it is true that the insect protein market it is a new market. But it is subject to regulations concerning the whole issue of grain, the whole issue of raw materials, and so on. So, in our case, obviously, when this whole adventure began, there was absolutely nothing regulated. We can say that it was legal, which means that in the animal feed markets, it is totally illegal. Illegality does not exist, although legally it was legal. So this gave us the option of being able to work within to develop a regulatory system in itself to be able to access the markets. So what we had to do was we got five companies together, we set up a platform in Brussels, and from there, what we did was lobby. Although I think that someone who says lobby never misunderstands it. In which we had to develop all the conditions to be able to enter the aquaculture, pork, poultry markets. Currently, we have developed, we have opened three markets. Pet food was already open, and above all, what we have done has been to standardize the way in which we have to work. That is to say, the hygiene and good practice guide that all food companies must have. We have obviously had to develop all of this together with the regulation itself, together with the European Commission, whether it be different working groups from DG Sante or others. And then it has also had to reach the European Parliament through the MEPs, because they are the ones who finally vote, also including the safety agency, the European agency, the European Food Safety Agency. In between, many scientific actions to demonstrate that it could be regulated in one way or another. But it has always been a total collaboration on that point. Of course, that has helped us to consolidate as a sector, because in our case, our customers obviously need traceability. Otherwise, they are not going to buy the products. They are tangible products. They are food products. We are talking about possibly one of the most aggressive markets in terms of regulation that there is, which I personally think is very good. And you can even take criminal action against companies, and even imprisonment, if you do something outside the regulation, which also has a negative impact on society. Whether it is poisoning part of the population, or, well, even just 10 people, because you have broken the regulation. So, well, these regulations are very positive because they give us the option to consolidate the sector. But it is also true that there are other types of regulations in the sector that are not always in place, which we are working on, which are basically to create much more circular models within our companies. 
I am referring to the insect sector, in which it is much more difficult to work together with the European Commission because we still have policies from 20 years ago from what happened with mad cow disease. So now, well, what they have to do somehow is to ensure that this situation does not happen again, not simply that we cannot be considered, we cannot develop new feeds for insects, reducing the waste, for example, that is generated in the European Union, when it is also one of the strong points of the farm-to-fork strategy the European Union has, simply because we have not worked on something that has happened and we are afraid of it. Well, let's move on. There is still a lot to do in terms of regulation. Another very important part is to consider insects organically. Well, your traceability has to be all organic, yes, but if we want to consider them as a source, not as having something tiny, but as a real source of new raw materials to complement that need because it is not a question of taking anyone out but of complementing the real need that exists. Well, obviously, and also knowing scientifically that all those residues of pesticides, etc., that the insect, thanks to the way it works biologically, makes them disappear, I think it is also very positive to be able to introduce them not only in conventional markets, but also in organic markets, because the product disappears. Those who cannot comply with the organic regulation and also try to lower the prices of organic products because the cost is the same for the producers of raw materials based on insects. So there are many things related to this type of regulation that need to change our vision and understanding, perhaps including more science, including more data, not just the legal side of things. I think in the end we have to build together, not each on our own. No, it doesn't make much sense especially if we are supposed to agree on the final objective. Well, that's the part that... And, well, of course, like all companies, we have to comply with Article 101, etc. But this is the basic competition law. So that's great. We can see that you are very clear about the outstanding regulatory issues in your sector, and that you are not shy. You roll up your sleeves and go to Brussels and work on it. That is great. We now have 10 minutes. I'm just going to ask Miguel to talk to us about competition and municipalities because it's something we haven't touched on yet. And then I will move on to the last questions, because there is one that would be addressed to Ileana, because we have some followers who ask us to refer to specific cases. Miguel, you have been developing a project on competition and municipalities together with the regional authorities. Let's talk about what are the competition problems at the municipal level. Why is it necessary to bring competition law closer to the municipalities? Much, Anna. Well, I will be very brief because, as the president has already, we are running out of time and the president has already introduced it to a certain extent in her presentation. I would just like to say that I think that it is probably the idea of municipalities and competences is the closest idea of all the promotion work we have done between citizens and competence. The idea of this project, which has arisen in collaboration with all the autonomous competition authorities in Spain, is precisely to identify a series of absolutely day-to-day -day problems, both for citizens and companies, but which affect the sphere of municipal intervention. And from there, in the most didactic way possible, and above all, in the field, always trying to hold forums or meetings in which not only all the citizens or companies affected, but also the local councils themselves have a great deal of weight or participation, so as to provide guidelines for competition that can improve the provision of certain services of municipal competence and that affect the citizen. 
There, as the chair commented, we have had stories that have been celebrated and were of great interest. There is the issue of urban mobility, the deployment of renewables, funeral services, which is always an area in competition law that generates many problems, many public procurement issues, but that is where the need to bring competition closer to the citizen and also the effort to know municipal regulation very well can be appreciated. Because I believe that when certain economic activities or sectors are dealt with in the area of promotion, sometimes we limit ourselves to studying the principles of competence of the sectoral regulations and really the sectoral regulations without taking into account the regulations, and not only the regulations, but the practice of municipal intervention. This does not reach, it does not reach the ground. I think that in cases, for example, such as the deployment of renewables, it is a very clear case. In the CNMC, moreover, with the collaboration of the energy section, we can know very very well what the existing regulation on the matter is, what the situation of the sector is. But the reality is that if in the end there is a municipal intervention necessary for all this project, all this renewable installation to be effectively deployed on the ground, and you have to take into account the position of the municipalities. You have to take into account their regulations. You have to take into account their difficulties. That I think it is quite relevant, their difficulties in terms of resources, the expertise required to carry out certain activities that many small and medium-sized municipalities do not have, and how this affects the development of competition in that particular sector, and always balancing it with municipal interests. Earlier on, there was a question about how we could do this. And I answered how, how we could bring the existence of infringement to the attention of the authorities without going into the area of infractions. I think it is essential for this project. We have experience of the CNMC's actions in the area of market unity which is very close to the citizen and very close to the municipalities. In matters of market unity, as you know, the CNMC, together with other bodies and agencies, has the power to, on the one hand, report on the existence of barriers and actions that are contrary to the principles of proportionality and necessity and that affect the exercise of economic activities, and also to appeal, as the chair said at the beginning, certain actions in any administrative sphere that are lower than the law. And there, in the analysis of the issues, and I will mention specific cases, I want to install a panel here in Salamanca. I want to install a panel for self-consumption in my house, and I have a town planning regulation that the city council invokes to tell me, well, you can't, because this is protected. So then you have to enter into a very circumstantial assessment of how the balance between the principles of competition and what the market guarantee law itself recognizes as, well, limitations, must always be based on imperative reasons of general interest. The exercise of a municipal power is, but it is not enough just to invoke it. It is not enough just to say that this is a protected historic site, which nobody disputes, but the administrations are obliged to ensure that the solution they provide is linked to this imperative reason of general interest, but also that it is proportionate and necessary, that is to say, that it is not a blank check to be able to do so. And I believe that this, projected onto these experiences of municipalities and competition, is very useful. For example, in the field of urban mobility, when I was coming here, I saw that a scooter almost, literally, almost ran over a lady who was walking in front of me. On the issue of urban mobility, we saw it. We saw how, on the one hand, we have to implement all the principles of competition, how we have to promote within the municipal regulation to guarantee the best access, the best competition within the sectors that are growing and that also have a very fragmented regulation depending on the type of municipality and the municipal policy in question. But you also have to take into account the interests of the municipality and the interests of the citizen in the face of this phenomenon. That is to say, there are cities that are prohibiting, for example, certain forms of urban mobility because the accumulation of vehicles on pavements prevents pedestrians from crossing. 
In other words, seeking a balance which, in the end, playing a little with, this is safeguarded by an overriding reason of general interest, is proportionate, and it is necessary to try to include it in the principles of competition law. But I think that if you don't go down to the ground to do it, that is, if you don't go to the municipality, if you don't contact all the interested parties, it's impossible, and in the end, it's like a block completely outside the law of competition. Thank you, Miguel. And maybe I'm going to pick up here to link what you're saying with a question we have via Slido. Someone asks how the work is distributed between the European Commission and the national authorities. And I would say that precisely from Brussels, we do not reach the municipality. And perhaps you can continue and answer this question since... Yes, well, I think that the ecosystem and the understanding of the different competences within the comprehensive application of competition law in Spain is a complex but very well-structured environment. The relationship between the European Commission and the CNMC has to do above all with the decentralized application of Articles 101 and 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The European Commission can always take on the processing of sanctioning procedures in the application of these articles, but this is generally done by the authorities of the member states, always with a mechanism of communication with the European Commission. And even effectively, it is difficult for the European Commission to reach the municipality, but that is precisely why this project on municipalities and competences is linked to the autonomous authorities because the CNMC has a lot of them, of the issues that are raised, cover or concern the regional competition authorities. Therefore, this coordination is necessary for us as CNMC, beyond the more transversal competence of market unity, to promote and coordinate with the regional authorities because they are the ones, for example, in the case of urban mobility, it is very clear they are the ones who face the problem on a daily basis. And I also believe that these types of more municipal problems are a priority. So in the end, in order to tackle these problems that reach the municipality, I think that sometimes it is necessary to involve the three bodies, namely the CNMC, the Commission, and the regional authorities. Thank you. Ileana, I also have a question here that perhaps you can answer directly. I am asked for concrete examples where competition cases have resulted in lower prices. Thank you, Anna, for your question. Let's see, we have collaborated a lot with the CNMC, as we said in the last step, when there is no other option, we file complaints, and during the last five years we have filed 15 complaints, which, as we said, we don't know if in the end, well, they have borne fruit because they have been sanctioned. And I'm going to highlight three that I think are important and that have obviously generated repercussions in the market. One is half done. You still have it there in the to-do list. I'll remind you of it. I'll take advantage of it. The first First of these is one of a drug, which I'm sure you remember, called, I don't want to say it badly, Lediant. Lediant was a drug that, taking advantage of the orphan drug legislation and a rather cumbersome legislation, multiplied its price per pill by a thousand. That is, that pill cost 0.145 euro, and the pill cost 145 euros because it changed its use under legislation. Well, we have problems. We still have a rather unclear and cumbersome legislation with medicines. Moreover, this was a European action with the European consumer organizations we work with. The CNMC imposed a fine of 10,250,000 euros. As we said, sometimes it is peanuts for these companies, but it did produce a debate. It became known, and it had a negative impact on the reputation of this laboratory. Another one that I mentioned a moment ago, the Audaz Renovables case, did lead to a 
Firstly, there was also a significant fine, nine million in this case, and it was for unfair competition. The CNMC determined that the practices were indeed unfair to energy companies that were doing well. This company called, said it was your own company, offered you discounts that were false. In other words, it was clearly lying. It was misleading consumers who switched companies. This company was eliminated. It was fined and has therefore stopped these practices. So no price reduction, but clarification. And this company has run out of customers. And the last one, which I think is also very closely related to the question asked by the colleague who is sitting there about inflation, is a complaint we have filed on reduflation, which is still under study. Reduflation basically means, due to the high prices of food products, what are some manufacturers doing? They are lowering the quantity of the product. They say that they are maintaining the price or that they have even lowered the price. They are maintaining the packaging. They are maintaining the packaging. They are maintaining the color. The consumer who goes in a hurry to do his shopping basket believes that this product is cheaper than the one next to it on the shelf. We have specifically denounced six very well-known manufacturers of very prestigious brands that that we all surely have in the fridge at home. Because, in fact, although on the shelf you know that it is compulsory to put the price per kilo or per liter, but the consumer still has the bad habit of not wearing glasses to see a lot and does not look at the price per liter or per kilo and buys his usual yogurt, his cocoa, which we are not going to say the brand he buys every time, of all his one or his usual frozen fish, thinking that it is the same and that has drastically reduced the weight. So we believe there is clear unfair competition towards manufacturers who are not engaging in this behavior. And of course, there is a clear deception of the consumer, because you cannot say we are maintaining the price or lowering the price. No, no, what you are reducing is the quantity. So there is a covert price increase. That is in the hands of the CNMC, in the hope that in the end, they will do something for the good of all consumers. And that is what I can tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're running out of time, but I'm going to open the floor. We're going to, there's time for a question from the floor. No one's up for it? Well, then I'm going to continue with the ones we have here via Slido, with the ones that don't come in remotely. And I'm going to have to choose because there's not enough time. There is a question that says, do you think that all sectors of the economy should be open to competition? And, for example, health. This is a question asked by Monica. Fernando? No, I say that everything, every sector, every economic operator and every sector is subject to the right to competition. What happens is that there are regulated sectors. This is where an administrative law regulation comes into play, which determines the market conditions. But it is also informed by competition law. That is true. What happens is that in the case of health in many countries, including ours, there are universal and free public health systems. And, of course, there is no possible or desirable application of the right to competition between the Madrid Health Service Hospital, La Paz, and the Madrid Health Service Hospital, Hospital de la Princesa. They do not compete with each other because they are part of a public system and there is no market relationship between them. But in the private health system that also exists in parallel to the universal and free public health system, of course there must be competition. In Madrid, to cite the city where I live, there is a company that clearly has a strong position in the market because you see it in different hospitals, some of which are in turn subsidized by the public system. And there are other private companies that also have hospitals. And I imagine that they must not be very happy with this majority presence of a private hospital or healthcare company. 
Where there is a market, there has to be competition. The same is true in education, the same in transport or wherever. If you will allow me, Anna, as a representative of a consumer organization, we believe that there are rights that need to be specially protected. And I think that perhaps this is also the point of the question. As Joaquin said, health and education are basic, essential rights, which perhaps, as they are not fully mature, need special protection or special vigilance. Even interaction on some occasions from the public administration or the government executive because they are essential for the citizens. So there you go, Monica. I hope your question has been answered. And that is the end of Markets for People in Salamanca. We are already three minutes over the allotted time. It only remains for me to thank the audience for being here. Thank you also to those who have followed us remotely, of course, the participation and the interesting session we have had with our invited experts, the University of Salamanca, and, of course, my colleagues here in the room, my colleagues from the European Commission, those who are supporting us from Brussels and the technicians from the Pomilio Bloom team. Thank you very much. And now you are all invited to an aperitif.